All right, welcome everyone. Good evening and welcome to the Center for Studies in Religion and Society's Thursday Public Lecture. Getting some feedback here. Uh, my name is Kathy Chan and I'm the Acting Director of the CSRS for the 2022-23 academic year. I'd like to open tonight's lecture by acknowledging and respecting the Lekwungen peoples on whose traditional territory the university stands and the Songhees, Esquimalt and the Saanich peoples who have continuing historical relationships with these lands. So tonight's public lecture is a special lecture because it features our current artist in residence, Holly Ratcliffe. Holly is a ceramic artist who came to us from the Montreal area and is also trained in anthropology and spirituality. She's uh, been a really valuable member of our community this year. Indeed, it's due to Holly that I have discovered that one of the great joys of being the CSRS director is that you get to do not only at normal academic things like host public lectures, but also less normal academic things like lining the carpeted office with temporary vinyl flooring <laughs> in the central <laughs> building. So welcome to Holly. It's been lovely having you this year. And I look forward to hearing more about your project on a ceramic in Thank you. Thank you. I can't not begin without giving thanks for many people. For Yvonne Sier, the donor who had the inspiration to create this artist residency. And for all the communities and individuals who have given moral and financial support for this year long adventure. I give thanks for the community of dialogue that is CSRS and for the Cedar Arts Ceramic Center. Victoria Potter's Guild for the hospitality of Jane, Robbie, and Alf, for my family and friends, and for Bobin. Lastly, I give thanks for all of you for coming or watching on Zoom. When I realized that this talk was scheduled for a holy day in Judaism, Christianity, Islam, and Hinduism, I considered asking that it be changed. But perhaps given the subject, there is more to it than coincidence. What is pentimento? The word has a long history of religious association as it's taken from the Italian pentirsi, to repent. And pentimenti is of course the plural. But in art history, the word pentimento has come to be used in oil paintings to refer to the reappearance of original elements, a sketch or underpainting that the artist tried to obliterate. I want to show you some slides of very famous paintings in which this has been the case. This is Picasso's famous old guitarist and I don't know whether you can see at that distance that another head is slightly visible. It's more visible in the close up here. There behind the neck, you can see a, a head that he had painted first. In Van Eyck's Arnolfini portrait, you can only see this in, by infrared light but the artist changed his mind as to the placement of the hand. And this is another interesting one. It's a portrait of Jacques de Norvain by Ingres. The bust of the infant son of Napoleon can be seen through the curtain on the left. It's much more visible with the help of infrared. <clears throat> and the erasure of the bust was after Napoleon's fall and was motivated not so much by stylistic reasons as by the rapidly changed social and political context. More recently in the field of biography, 
the concept of pentimento has been taken up in a new way to describe how memories of early life may return with new nuances as a person ages. The concept game came to my attention in religious understandings of a good death in hospice palliative care. This is a book co-edited by CRS, CSRS founding director, Harold Coward, and Kelly Stadjuhar, director of the Center on Aging at UVic, where Pentimento is extended to biographical situations at end of life. This book, which addresses the needs of the dying in most of the major world religions, is a must read for anyone engaged in working with the dying. The authors of the first chapter give the example of people from communist countries living in hospice care and facing imminent death. Some find themselves returning to the religious beliefs and symbols of their youth, which they had abandoned during their lifetime under communism. It was this short example in the book which inspired my project. It gave me the idea of researching individuals whose histories might reveal such experiences. I'm discovering patterns of pentimenti that exist in other cultural contexts. For example, among First Nations and Inuit peoples here in Canada, embracing their spiritual roots after living with the traumatic effects of colonialism. Something of this nature can happen in others' experience at the end of life as well, or at a time when a life-changing event happens to them. This includes people who may have voluntarily given up their spiritual or religious roots in adulthood. I have chosen to explore biographies drawing from a variety of belief systems at this level of research, my work is phenomenological, based on individuals' subjective experiences of how they have responded to their end-of-life experience. I've spent a good time, a good deal of time, planting seeds and interviewing people from different backgrounds in the Victoria area whose story could fit the nature of the subject. I've conducted interviews with people who work in hospice care, with family members, and I've taken material from historical testimonies. I write up a short biography for each based on the interview or the written text. I change the names as needed to protect privacy. A period of re reflection follows how to render that biography in visual form. As the biographies I find are of the lives of individuals from various contexts, each one must be different. And why choose urns for that form? This project's exploration into the ceramic urn's capacity for symbolic expression foregrounds both the lost art of funeral wear and the lost art of dying in different religious traditions and spiritual practices. It aims to promote a gentle reflection on what might constitute the good death, death and mourning experienced as profoundly meaningful, even and perhaps especially where suffering is involved. Each of these urns seeks to express the return to roots of belief and or spiritual practice that had been forbidden, forbidden, abandoned, or simply not taken seriously earlier in the life of the individual. And in all cases, this death is perceived as a trauma, a personal or social limit experience which changes the person's priorities and in different ways may draw them to their early members, I'm sorry, their early memories 
of religious or spiritual experience for whatever practices give them comfort and meaning. But how to create a pentimento effect of a person's life history on ceramics. Painting over a sketch on canvas is one thing. Using ceramic materials and glazes to express the phenomenon of pentimento in depth, translucency, and textures of patina is quite another. This is the technical and aesthetic challenge which this project has set before me. Here's a simple but effective example of a ceramic pentimento on a very familiar mug at CSRS. It was made by Vancouver Island potter, Daryl Hancock. The white glaze applied first and leaving much of the ceramic mug unglazed appears through the sapphire blue glaze subsequently applied. The challenge for me is to express the fruits of the biographical research in ceramic funerary vessels that somehow reflect the life trajectory of spiritual pain and trauma, yet also hope, resiliency, courage, trust, and sometimes even joy where it is present in each story. The eventual outcome will be an exhibition of the urns, each with its biography nearby. I am nowhere near ready for that exhibition. However, I'll show a slide at the end of this uh, slideshow that gives the details for a work in progress exhibition that will begin next week here at UVic. The intention behind the idea of an exhibition is to encourage viewers to reflect on their own perhaps unquestioned attitudes toward death and the assumptions they make about the place of their own beliefs in making sense of it. I understand that the use of urns is not a universal mortuary practice, but it's sufficiently symbolically meaningful to evoke responses. In this regard, I've been inspired by the powerful contemplative effect on the viewer of the forms by, created by contemporary British potter, Julian Stair, in his exhibition, Quietus, The Vessel, Death, and the Human Body. He first exhibited these standing sarcophagi, ossuaries, and cinerary jars at Mima in England, a white box gallery setting. But then he took it to other settings, like Winchester Cathedral and the Dead House at Somerset House, a kind of crypt environment. Stair's corpus impelled me to want to explore death contemplatively, to befriend it through ceramic creation. My interest in making urns, which began in 2018, is really fired by the problem of the denial of death in our Western culture. A number of books on the subject is appearing these days. Being Mortal, Medicine and What Matters in the End by Atul Gawande is a classic. It describes how medicalized and hidden from sight death has become. Other books, such as Smoke Gets in Your Eyes and Other Lessons from the Crematory by Caitlin Doughty, reflect on current mortuary practices, which have taken the care of the deceased person's body completely out of the hands of grieving loved ones, leaving them feeling useless. The message in these books is that we are left without a sense of the meaning of death. And as a result, we do not know what it might mean to prepare for a good death. 
Unless it touches us directly, we do not experience it. We don't think about it. And when we do, we find we have little language for the subject. I've discovered a number of books turned to Tibetan Buddhism for beliefs and spiritual practices, which can help restore a meaningful language around death and suffering for those in hospice because of the close relation between meditation and preparation for death in that tradition. But I wonder what is available for those in hospice who come from other major religious traditions. I have to come clean about my own background. For many years, I have studied the history of Christian mysticism as one means to make sense of suffering in my own and others' lives. And although raised as a secularist, I'm now an Anglican priest. I'm fascinated by lost or historical spiritual practices which might help us now to befriend death. My study focused on Julian of Norwich, a 14th century English mystic and anchoress. After she received revelations of the love of God for humankind, at a point when she thought she was dying, she went on to be enclosed for the rest of her life in a cell or anchor hold, which symbolized the, the tomb of Jesus. The presence of an anchoress attached to the church and available for hearing the concerns of others was very helpful for the larger community trying to make sense of massive suffering due to the Black Death at that time. Julian was part of a long tradition of practicing the daily remembrance of one's death, memento mori. The need for this in a culture with a high mortality rate was obvious. I'm not suggesting a return to the anchoritic life, but I seek to be sensitive to the kinds of human and contextual needs which are experienced around death now, and which religious, spiritual, and mystical, and artistic traditions might speak to. The subject of death is by nature messy, liminal, requiring us to get out of our heads. And any lived experience or practice worthy of the name religious or spiritual must at some le level enable us to engage the discomfort that death can create. So religious and spiritual are terms that I use interchangeably insofar as they do this. I was delighted to discover Dr. L. S. Dugdale's book called The Art of Dying which draws on the Judeo-Christian tradition of the Ars Moriendi to, pro to propose ways in which religious rituals in community can help us become more humanized in our attitudes toward our mortality. She gives some wonderful examples from the Jewish tradition and some focuses for meditation from Christianity. And I hope to be researching Islam and other traditions as well. But Dugdale writes, and this is a doctor, to die well requires that we live well. And we live best in the company of communities that help us make sense of our finitude. i.e. long before we find ourselves in a palliative condition. She concludes her book thus, the body withers and fades. This is surely to be expected, but we are not without resources, existential, ritual, and practical. And as we walk together toward the fear and the sadness, 
as we sit low to grieve our own dying or the death of others, we may find ourselves transformed in the process. The transformation is not from sickness to health or from death to life. Rather, it is the change that comes from experiencing the profound. We grow wiser, more whole. We discover calm in turmoil, light in shadow, beauty in decay. Unquote. For some time, funeral wear has also been absent from our consciousness around what is necessary in preparing for our death, just as funeral rituals have been. The selection of an urn is frequently an afterthought. And I've actually met people who feared that buying an urn early would hasten their end. Urns, ossuaries, and sarcophagi may not leap to mind when we think of fine craft, let alone fine art. And of course, with the turn to dispersing ashes and green burials, there may be questions about the need for permanent funeral vessels at all. And that's a whole other subject I can't go into today. My interest in the meaning of death in Christian history and how that might be expressed in ritual and art has led me to exploring other historical and prehistorical expressions of mortuary material culture for creative inspiration. What often remains in archeological finds is the funeral wear, intimately related to the people's beliefs and rituals around what happens in and after death. Artworks are buried or burned, as we saw last week in Rebecca Hall's lecture on funerary structures in Northern Thailand, never to be seen again. I could spend the rest of this hour showing slides of some of the varieties of ways humankind has created vessels to contain the dead and express communally held beliefs. But instead, I'll offer a brief artist statement of influences and inspirations that can be seen in my work to date. So this is an, a slide of, from South Appalachia, that is what we would call Georgia now in the States, uh, obviously dating before the Trail of Tears. And, um, and it's two bowls. It was the, for the burial of a child. And it's just two bowls placed one on top of the other. And this work that I'm showing you now inspired my piece called Womb Tomb, um, created during an artist's residency at the Museum of Anthropology in Vancouver, BC in 2020. That's where I began to look for sources of inspiration in the formal languages, that is the simple profiles and designs of ancient Asian, Neolithic and Indonesian, sorry, indigenous traditions of funeral art. The ancient Japanese Jomon tradition of rope impression produced this 5,000 year old urn. And I'm really drawn to rope impression. Here's one of my own. <laughs> my work aligns stylistically, however, with the matierist, the abstract expressionist tradition, which in ceramics began with Peter Volkov. I'll just show you two of his uh, pieces. Here's a, a jar, a huge jar with heavy layered textures and a plate with abstract figures. It is the intrinsic materiality of clay which draws me to create more by having a conversation with the medium 
than by setting out with a fixed objective. So here's uh, also a past work that I've done, one of the uh, moss green urns, which I consider to be a conversation with textures of slip. And I'll show you one work in a series of portrait plates, which uh, after the fact I realized express various grief responses. This plate is called Laum or tear. And the first slide, this first slide shows the piece having been layered with oxide colorants before firing. And this is the same plate after firing. My, my work seeks to, to counter the contemporary Western reactions of discomfort and denial in the face of death and make more accept, accessible something of its universal and silent mystery. So where have I got so far? So far in this research on Pentimento, I've received a variety of biographies for inspiration, stories from different traditions, a Tibetan monk, a Ukrainian Orthodox Christian, a Church of English, Church of England slash Unitarian, a, an, an Inuit from Nunatukabut, a lapsed Roman Catholic, and a Dutch Reformed. And I hope the list will continue to grow in diversity as well as numbers. And if, you, if this is reminding you of someone, please speak to me afterwards. Some biographies are loaded with issues pertaining to colonialism and other systemic injustices. And I find myself questioning whether I have the right to express the experience of individuals or draw on inspirations from their material culture. Even before I arrived in Victoria, I sought the approbation of the UVic Ethics Review Board, and the board was fine with the project because it wasn't academic research. But issues of subject appropriation of indigenous persons and their arts is real, it intersects. And it's addressed in the book, another book edited by CSRS, uh, former uh, director. Anyway, the book is called The Ethics of Cultural Appropriation. And it's made me attentive to seeking the approval of family or community where this arises. And I acknowledge that access to such voices may be quite difficult. Hence the extraordinary value of a published firsthand historical record, if it can be found. I've been enriched by the depth and variety of biographies shared to date. They are not all happy endings, though some are. My own understanding of others' religious traditions is being stretched. So I go on to the results in the studio. I'm not at home, this is not my studio. And I actually have very limited time available in the very well-equipped Cedar Arts Community Center, about six to eight hours a week. This is the center. And so my office has become as Kathy observed, an extension. As an art medium, ceramics is very process oriented. It is time consuming. Things can only be done at certain conditions or consistencies of the clay. And only at the end do choices of glaze and firing techniques get made. So you will understand that I do not have many urns finished yet. Usually I begin by throwing or turning on the, the wheel. Sometimes they do get thrown off the wheel to avoid that. I seek to create a form with good proportions and a profile which is restful to the eye. In throwing, this takes a lot of concentration on the wheel. And then I continue with surface treatments, texture, sgraffito, mishima, gesture, etc. 
Okay, there we go. So this is a textured urn, unfired. Until now, my method of treating the surface has been spontaneous. That is not dependent on knowing what the outcome will be. And then after the bisque fire, which makes the clay porous enough to absorb the glaze, I fire again. But in the project here at CSRS, I'm beginning with a person's life history, their spiritual biography, which I want to respect and express through this medium. And because what I want to express is the pentimento experience, I need to begin very early on in the process to think backwards, so to speak. If I want such and such an effect in the end, where do I need to begin? And that needs to be done when the clay is moist, so right at the beginning. Since each urn has its unique story, this project has added a much more difficult level of integration and uh, integration of reflection and thought to my exploration of the creative medium. The Cedar, Cedar Hill Art Center ceramic studio has 20 different glazes, plus all their permutations when each glaze is dipped before or after another. So, and these are all along one wall as a series of test tiles, 400 of them. And even then the test tiles don't tell us everything we need to know about, about how the glazes will behave. It's hard work to express in clay this narrative aspect, and at the same time, make the most of the creative methods of abstract surface treatment and glazing in which the outcome can be quite unknown and unexpected. And these are new glazes to me, so it's been a, quite a ride. Caleb Speller, a ceramic artist at the center, observed that I was, and I'm quoting him, entering into the narrative of others, not my own narrative, which is very hard. It can lead to becoming focused on some fixed outcome or technique. Unquote. That was that was revelatory. It was good to hear this back. It was uh, good feedback, and it was certainly up until then leading me into a state of paralysis around glazing, and also I need to recognize that I I don't leave myself at the door when I am creating. My own positionality and all of that gets revealed. I've come to treat each urn as a sketch or a maquette rather than the finished work. But the paralysis has shifted into action quite recently after Caleb showed me a technique he uses, which I think will be sig a significant breakthrough precisely because it coheres with the meaning of pentimento. I've come to call it the speller deglaze technique. First, to give credit to Caleb, but also because it involves literally adding layer upon layer of glaze and then spraying it off with water to reveal layers underneath. Here's an example. There's a small bowl, and I put that rope texture into the clay when it was still wet. Here is the bowl colored with two slips while it's still uh, leather hard, blue and then white slip to highlight the texture, which is called Mishima. Here's the same bowl after the bisque fire. And then the glazing, deglazing, waxing, repeat. It's fun. And then the fired bowl. So this is my first attempt, right? So, but every side is different. So I think there's a lot of possibility in this technique. If I've got a bit of time, I'll turn to one or two of the urns themselves and their stories. 
Jampa Rinchen, his own testimony is found as an appendix in the book, Forbidden Memory, Tibet during the Cultural Revolution. A period, it's full of photographs of a period that has been erased from Tibetan history. Jampa was born in Lhasa. He was sent to be a monk from the age of seven at Drepung Monastery as an attendant to one of the tutors of the 14th Dalai Lama. When the People's Republic of China annexed Tibet in the 1950s, he had to decide whether to stay or leave. He stayed and was re-educated during the Cultural Revolution. He respected Mao Zedong's thought, but as the reforms were carried out, and with the violence that that included, he had no choice but to relinquish his Buddhist practices. He was ordered to smash a stupa containing sacred Buddhist texts. And with others, he burned the texts rather than leave them for an even worse fate. His personal testimony is written in 2003, the year that he died. He is filled with grief that he cannot return to being a monk. He believes that the bad karma he has brought upon himself by the actions he was required to take during the revolution prohibit him now from wearing the monk's robes again and will have an effect on his subsequent reincarnation. He fears that at his sky burial, the traditional Tibetan ritual of handling the body after death, the birds will not consume his remains. At the time of telling his story, he worked as a janitor at the Jokhang Temple for many years until his death. So what struck me first about his story was its spiritually tragic nature. I found myself looking at contemporary Tibetan, Tibetan art for inspiration and found it in the work of Tenzing Rigdol, his series of brocade paintings he calls, My World is Your Blind Spot. He describes this series of paintings as concerning the self-immolation of Tibetan monks under censorship. But it struck me that Jampa's silent suffering was not unlike this. The ginger jar form for the urn struck me as very appropriate for Jampa. And the Tenzing Rigdal art gave the idea for a lid that would also reference the Buddha. And after throwing the first urn, I made a plaster mold of it because I had a feeling I'd be making a few tests. Jampa's urn is made of porcelain using coils inside the mold form to give a sense of the cyclical nature of life and reincarnation as understood in Buddhism. His history is so different from mine and the color palette, lobster red, yellow, brilliant red, black, is not one that I would typically use. So here it is the, with slips, again, before firing, and again, underglazes added before firing. And then I put a black glaze onto it, which I knew would shrink or crawl over the other layers. In fact, the glaze is called brain crawl. Here's the fired piece. I wanted to express Jampa's sense of great regret, what I would call self-judgment because of the actions he'd taken part in that prohibited from him from returning to the life of the monk. But the cracks in the glaze revealing the color of the monk's robes below express also compassion and hope of the limited choice he had living through that era. And I was heartened to read elsewhere in the book that when he died, the monks of Jokhang Monastery meditated through his death with him. 
as is their custom. I realize my time is running out, so I'll just uh, I have another urn that I would tell you about, but I'll just stop there for now. I've got another five? Okay. So this one in particular, I have to say, I've been meditating and reflecting on Jantha's life for five months now. And it really has brought a kind of new, new questions around my own approach and, and also the assumptions I would make about Buddhism and karma. It seems to me that in a worldview in which bad karma can be worked through in subsequent lives, perhaps there is no ultimate tragedy. It's just a different kind of time frame than Western Christians and secularists tend to think in, accustomed as we are to instant everything. This is a portrait of Jim Learning. Jim was an Inuit man from Nunatakabut in South Labrador, and his story was told to me by his daughter, Karen, whom I met at her work at the Institute on Aging here at UVic. And I have her permission to share it with you. He was raised in the town of Cartwright. <clears throat> and that means he was Anglican because it was an Anglican mission and everyone then was baptized Anglican. He had a terrible experience early in life when his young sister died before the missionary could come around and baptize her. So she was never um, entered into the birth record. It was as if she didn't exist. Jim left uh, South Labrador for Alberta for most of his working life. But when he came home in his 50s, he began to hunt and fish for his own food, as his ancient Inuit forebears did. At some point, he learned he had cancer, <clears throat> and he accepted no treatment for it. But when he had grandchildren, he had a vision of eternal life through them. It coincided with his fear for their future, as the habitat of the Grand River was being destroyed by the construction of the Muskrat Falls Dam. His leadership and political resistance in the face of the government's refusal to listen to the Inuit is with hunger strikes and incarcerations for simply walking on his family's ancient lands is now fondly remembered by family and the larger community. But for him, it was all grounded in living and preserving for future generations, the spirituality of living on the land the practices absorbed in his youth from his family. He had nothing to lose because he knew all those years that he was dying. The form, I knew that a ginger jar was not gonna do it for Jim. So the form was inspired by the ancient ulu knife, which is used by women for skinning animals and preparing food. I love this form, but how to incorporate it into an urn? The idea took three-dimensional shape when I came across Inuit artist Michael Massey's contemporary work entitled Ulu Teapot. Michael is from Nunatsiavut, or Northern Labrador. In my case, the form is also inspired by the kayak and other boats which Jim used for fishing and visiting Inuit villages along the coast. So it all came together using slabs of clay and heavy texturing. So the work goes on. I have other examples, but don't have time. I'd like to say at this point, I know something I didn't know when I began, that part of the project of identifying pentimenti is also a process of becoming more conscious of and reflecting on how my own interpretive lens gets expressed in the work. And as well, I continue to be excited 
about how the ceramic process can express stories of spiritual homecomings that can help restore meaning to death and human finitude in a contempt contemplative mode. Thank you. Thank you so much, Holly. That was a really wonderful, beautiful presentation. And um, what do I want to say? For me, it, it captures something of the experience I've had as, as well as well at the CSRS this year. Just the way that you draw in uh, your experience of the real world, right, and at the same time seek to experience and understand the profound. So thanks very much. Um, we have uh, 10 or 15 minutes. We've gone a little bit longer, um, but I did want to see if anyone had any questions, um, either online or in the chat. Yeah, Peter. Holly, this is fantastic. Thank you for having the urns here for us to, to look at afterwards. What were some of the surprising things from the interviews? Of, of living human beings that you've been able to do? Have you had surprises? Hmm. Well, yes. I mean, there, I've interviewed one person who, um, who's coming near to death was uh, quite a dramatic experience. He wasn't near death at all. He was a young man, but he was um, feeling suicidal. And so he went on a kind of well, I guess a spirit quest, I suppose, in into the um, into the wilderness, and discovered um, had quite a quite a fantastic uh, mystical experience there. He's written a book about it too, Greg Dandino. A wonderful talk, thank you. Um, <clears throat> I'm curious. You alluded in the talk just in terms of how. Um, in medical industry, like our, our deaths are not so much our own anymore. Um, they are tend to be co-opted. I'm, I'm curious about like um, uh, how in, in this process and exploring uh, with people in their, their, their voyage of death, like how this is a, an act of reclaiming our deaths, if you will. And if you could just a comment, but I'm particularly interested in light of this in this country and made and just like how um, you know, the medical system is further and further in preaching on what was natural, organic, spontaneous, spiritual experiences now like further and further under control. And mm -hmm. like, how are you finding this expressed in just what your, your research is? Well, I'd, I'd recommend that book by Doug Dale, The Lost Art of Dying. Um, she's coming out of that medical system and the first chapter describes um, the death of a man in... Um, in emergency, and they resuscitated him or tried to resuscitate him three times in the night. And part of the, re the reason that they kept trying was partly the medical system, you know, the code blue goes on and they go into action. Um, it was also partly the de denial of their family. The, the, um, the family came from a certain tradition that was hoping and praying for something miraculous to happen. This was an elderly gentleman. So she goes on through the book then to describe how we can begin to prepare it during our lifetime um, so that we, we are prepared when we get to that point to make just, to take agency to ourselves and make decisions. Does that make sense? That's it. Oh, that's okay. I, I have a question about, I, I wanted to ask you your thoughts on, for purposes of this project, kind of the relationship between death and suffering. I mean, you started mm. out by telling us, right, that you um, were, had become interested in Christian mysticism, partly as a a mode or a tradition that helps understand human suffering. 
but there's a, you know, there's a sense that death, we associate death with suffering, but there's another sense in which it is just an end to our mortal lives. And I'm interested if you reflect on that in the course of making your urns, if there are different stories that tell different stories about the relationship between suffering and death and whether that's reflected in your art. Well, I guess that's what I was trying to communicate in my, my reflection on Jampa Rune Chen is that I could, I could, I had compassion on his suffering all those years of not have, not being able, not feeling that he could return to being a monk. Um, so that was a kind of suffering. It's not, it's more of a, an internal uh, psychological suffering or spiritual suffering than physical. Um, and it's kind of during his life, right? Rather than. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But he, yeah. Yeah. Um, so have I been reflecting on suffering at death, you mean? Yeah, and is it is it reflected in, in your urns? Do they is it is it a theme that comes out in the colors or the um, is there a more joyous urn and a less joyful urn? Well, you know, there will be joyful be? urns. Yeah. I yeah. I you know, this second this this is the um, this brown one is the urn that I made. I I showed a photograph of it yeah. for um this one. That one yeah. for gym learning. And, you know, slabs of clay usually work just fine, but I found that across the top, there are cracks appearing. And it made me reflect on maybe the fact that, you know, he, he had a very um, meaningful life and meaningful death. But even so, you know, the government is continuing to plan other power plants and so on. So it's, you know, suffering at that level, not exactly personal, but it's sort of a collective um, suffering. So it's it's a it's a work in progress. Yeah, <laughs> we appreciate you sharing it with us. Thank you. Keep asking. It's this shape. It in um, in Asian ceramics, every form has its own name. The pear shape, the ginger jar. You probably know all of this, uh, or some of this, uh, Noriko. But anyway, there's uh, there's a name for every profile. Yeah. Yeah, we have a question over here. I was wondering if the gift, if the urns will be gifted to the families after the exhibit, and if so, has there been a difference between? making art for oneself versus making art as a gift for others? Well, I, I would give it if they wanted it. You know, I haven't been asked for it, so that's, you know. And I have given urns away too. It's not that, uh, it's not that I do this just for exhibitions. Usually I'm at home working and I'll get a phone call. You know? This is the first time I've done anything of this nature. But I understand what you're saying. If it was requested, I would give it. An interesting reflection too, right, on the you know, different functions that they perform, right? You kind of mentioned that at the beginning that they, they literally hold ashes some That's of the it. time, but they are much more than that, right? In what you're what you're doing. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. We have maybe time for one more question. Got it. <laughs> Elizabeth asks, who takes the time to value a human life and express its unique value through art and language to the degree that you do? Or for that matter, who takes the time to value the uniqueness of living individuals either to the degree that you do? So compliments begin. Such valuing has to involve both love and the profoundest contemplation. So shout out from the, uh, the Zoom audience. <laughs> I'm told to say thank you. Hi. Very nice. All right, well, 
We're just about nearing the end of our time. I think that we can use a few minutes at the end. I think if we wrap up, well, too bad for people on Zoom, but those of us who are in mm -hmm. um, can uh, take a little bit of time to come up and, and see the funerary urns. So <laughs> let me thank Holly for uh, her words and the beautiful art that and for sharing it with us on this day. If we had to be here on a day of so many holidays, I think this was a wonderful thing to share together. So thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank <laughs> you.